Whether you're looking for a convenient refresher course, or a way to earn your Pragmatic certification at your own speed, or the chance to take a Pragmatic course from your specific corner of the world, then Foundations On Demand is the solution you need. Get the same great content, tools, and templates our Foundations course is famous for in a flexible and easy-to-use online learning platform. Learn the skills you need to build and market products people want to buy. And earn your Pragmatic Institute certification anywhere, anytime. No more travel worries, no more time zone issues, just truly great training. Experience the new way of training with Foundations On Demand from Pragmatic Institute. Visit pragmaticinstitute.com slash foundations to learn more. Welcome, everybody. I am Georgina Donahue, the Director of Community here at Pragmatic Institute. I have the very great pleasure of being joined by Jasmine Degaya, who is the Head of Customer Data Strategy at Wells Fargo. And we're in for a really wonderful discussion on how AI is revolutionizing how we approach our roles, our strategies, our responsibilities, and some of the really powerful ways that we can capitalize on it in our own product work. So once again, I'm Georgina Donahue. I'm the director of community at Pragmatic Institute. And um, Kelly, you can pop me to the next slide because I'm really excited. I have a special shout out today uh, because Pragmatic just opened a limited run workshop. Um, it's AI for product professionals. And it's a workshop that's designed to really give you the skills that you need to create streamlined workflows and really optimize product decision making um, through the use of generative AI and prompt engineering. It's a really small group workshop, uh, so you can definitely expect a lot of interactive breakout sessions, direct feedback on your deliverables, meaningful discussions, et cetera. Um, and so I really wanted to make it available uh, to this community of folks because spots are really very limited. So I encourage you to jump in now um, if that strikes your interest. So now that that housekeeping is out of the way, I am really delighted for you to meet our expert guest, Jasmine Degaya. So Jasmine is a product exec and the head of customer data strategy at Wells Fargo. She has also, she's probably going to blush a little bit because I'm going to brag about her big time. Um, she was recently recognized as the chief data um, by Chief Data Officer Magazine as one of their 2023 global power women. Um, she's got over 20 years of experience. She really um, excels at leading high performing, large scale product, technology, digital data transformation organizations, right? Um, so she's an absolute visionary leader and she's really well known for delivering large scale multi year product strategies. So there's just a tremendous amount that we have to learn from her today. And we're really so lucky to have her with us. Uh, we're going to talk about um, all things product strategy and product development in light of AI. So I'm going to pass the reins to you, Jasmine, to share a little bit more about yourself and your interests before we dive in and start peppering you with questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Georgina. And I have to say, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I've had so much respect and uh, deep connection with the Pragmatic Institute for going on probably 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, a long time ago, I used to run the Silicon Valley Product Management Association mm -hmm. um, uh, from when it, it uh, just kicked off as a small grassroots organization. And we, we worked very closely with colleagues at the Pragmatic Institute as well. So delighted to be here. Um, really excited to, to hear from your audience and have a great, great discussion today. That's great. I can't wait. Um, all right, I'm just going to jump right into the mix of things. Um, to kick things off, I'm going to ask you to share some stories and some examples with us. I think that a lot of the folks that we have chatted with um, are, you know, and a lot of the big conversations you see kind of making the rounds on LinkedIn and spaces like that are really thinking about how we start scratching the surface of using AI. So using it to write copy for us or, you know, make our day-to-day -day operations a lot easier or summarize large content sets for us. 
But what I've been hearing lately in the past kind of one or two weeks from our community of alumni is that we're really hungry for examples and successful case studies of kind of more innovative or next gen AI applications. So I'm curious to hear from you. What are some of the ways that you are currently leveraging AI in your work um, or how you're seeing it leveraged within your professional product circle? What are kind of the ways that people are thinking ahead about AI? Yeah, great question. Great question. And I think there's a lot of different dimensions as far as how you can use AI. And I think a really key way of grounding that, because it can it can be overwhelming if you think about all the potential opportunities, is to really bring it back to why. What are you trying to solve? What is the purpose um, of what you're trying to do? And within that focus, then I would break it down essentially into three big buckets. Um, One is, are there ways that you can use AI to essentially generate new revenue with your products? So how can it enable you to reach new markets, new geographies, um, better tune your your products to certain personas or audiences? Um, So how can you use it to enhance your existing product offerings? The second key dimension is really around How can you use it to increase your margins on your product, your overall financial efficiency? Um, And that could be all of the uh, operational components of how you launch your product. So whether that is um, the behind the scenes costs of customer service or your speed to market um, or your efficiency in terms of the amount of time you're spending on bug fixing versus um, putting quality product out there from the, from the launch. Um, so thinking about that from an operational efficiency and cost savings perspective. The third piece is really where I think things get super interesting. So if you've started to build that muscle memory and those capabilities in those first two dimensions, then you've organizationally built the confidence and the skills and the capability to really look at that third component, which is how can I transform my products um, using AI? How can I think about net new uh, capabilities, things I never even imagined before, really being predictive and proactive to address what the market is looking for? Um, And I'll give you an, an analogy. I think that's relevant here. If you think back to when the internet first came on the scene, a lot of companies really approached that as this is something that I'm just going to slap onto the top of my existing bricks and mortar, brick and mortar um, infrastructure, right? My product is still my, my core tangible product. When people were a little bit resistant, you saw a whole spectrum of how different organizations approached it. Um, and what some of those companies fail to realize is that This new capability is not just a technology transformation, it's a business transformation. It's affecting how people view your products, how they engage with your product, how they um, interact with it, right? And so it's, if you think about the ability to see reviews, recommendations, ratings, do real-time competitive uh, comparison shopping, all these things completely change the customer product experience. And so... Thinking about how AI can really transform your the fabric of your product, uh, I think really is is critical to how you how you approach this. I love that, and I I feel like we're only at the very top of our conversation, but we already have this like amazing um, kind of takeaway, which is it's not. Um, It's not just about transforming technology, it's a business transformation. And I think that that's a really key differentiating way of thinking about this phenomenon as a a really big factor in the way that we work and the way that we bring products to market. I love that. Yeah, Yeah. it's not just a bolt on to what you're doing currently, but it's really something that we need to think about how we integrate it into our entire product. That's right. That's right. Even when we're not using it directly, you still need to be aware of it so intimately, which is a a really great insight. Um, I think that this next question leads leads in very naturally um, because that is such kind of a um, high level perspective that you bring already. So I think, you know, we all recognize the significance across the board and this business transformation. I'm curious, when you're thinking about this from a product leadership perspective, right, how should product leaders specifically be paying attention to AI or what exactly should they be honing in on kind of more than other things? 
Yeah, so I think um, I would look at it across the entire product delivery life cycle. So um, as a good framework for how you think about where you can apply capabilities. So, um, and I saw some interesting research from Gartner the other day saying that uh, 40% of digital product enhancements are going to be driven by AI-based tools in the next, you know, within the next couple of years. So it gives you a gives you a benchmark for how prevalent this is going to be. Um, and so from a product life cycle perspective, if you think about what are the major tasks that you do at each of those key stages and how much time do they take and how can you make them more efficient through the use of AI? So from very early um, idea generation, market research, competitive analysis, ways that you can use AI to help you. And, and that's a really good use case for AI, right? Because it can absorb large amounts of data, distill it down, summarize it for you, um, and also start looking at predictive capabilities of what are the trends that are happening? What um, would you expect to see and how can that relate to your specific product? And then if you start to look at design and prototyping, I always come back to some of the fundamentals of product management, which are who is your customer? What do they want? What problem are you solving for them? What are their pain points? And what value are you creating ultimately? How are you making their lives easier? And AI is a good tool here for us to be able to then do A-B testing, use different personas um, through AI so you can validate different features and different prototypes very quickly um, as opposed to traditional approaches to doing that. Then moving to development, testing, and launch, this is a huge area where you can see lift from AI through um, particularly speeding up your, uh, your coding capabilities, using um, AI to address repetitive tasks, insert code snippets, um, do bug testing, test for security flaws, user documentation or as software documentation, user notes, things like that can all be generated through, um, through AI. And then the last piece of this, um, which I think is a really important one and sometimes doesn't get the attention that it deserves, is the feedback aspect of the product life cycle. And we've seen a lot of organizations starting to use AI from a customer support and customer service perspective, which I think is a really great use case. And if you think about user feedback, a lot of that is actually also product feedback. And so tapping into that and piggybacking on um, any initiatives that your organization might have to use AI for customer service is I think, a really great way to get structured, curated, real-time product feedback that you can then also incorporate into your um, into product development. So. Those are is such a great outline of, of really looking at the different aspects of the product life cycle. I'm curious from your perspective for folks that are really very much involved in the product development life cycle, really kind of in a hands-on capacity as these big um, tectonic shifts are happening at a kind of a strategic level for their products. You know, how, how do you suggest that folks that are really involved day to day start to adjust their process and what should they be ready for? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the number one thing I would say is keep an open mind and keep learning. Um, so it's it's changing so fast. And every single day, every, every news site you go to, you, there's always something about AI. And so I think just really keeping an open mind about how do I stay up to date on this, really engaging and um, being uh, being proactive about looking for opportunities to uh, to use AI in your organization is really key. Um, and I think also remembering that even when you're using AI, it's not magic, right? It's it's a tool, it's a capability, and ultimately you are still in charge and you are still responsible and accountable um, for what's being produced. And uh, I think it's really important, particularly from a leadership perspective, to instill that culture of um, accountability and that people are still fully responsible for the explainability, the transparency um, of, the, of the outputs that they're using. Um, while it's, it's a great resource, ultimately we still need to, need to maintain that um, sense of responsibility with what we're using. 
Yeah, makes sense. Um, I I like the phrase a lot that robots are for facts um, and humans are for experiences and decisions <laughs> um, and balancing yeah, them right. together and having them kind of come together in the same space is really what drives us forward. Yeah. Um, so I agree with that as well. Um, I have a question here um, asking if you have seen any kind of examples of how um, you mentioned kind of using AI in the prototype testing and the feedback um, process of development. Do you have any examples of how AI in the product prototype testing phase differs from traditional models or how you would see that kind of advance going forward? So one really great use case that I've seen is where people are using um, AI to essentially create a whole multitude of different personas of people that use the product. So you can you can define that persona, their characteristics, their behaviors, um, and you can do it very quickly and have it be um, really robust and multidimensional versus kind of um, I recall doing some some personas where you know it's it they can be a little bit flat right you have you just have some characteristics about who might be using your product and then t- sometimes people forget to put that hat on of that other persona and how is this person actually going to engage with my product and so i think this is a really good uh, use case for validating um, various prototypes various feature options but also even prioritizing what features you want to build next by um, kind of putting them up against these various personas and seeing which ones resonate, um, which ones really solve pain points for customers. Um, And maybe even looking at, uh, coming back to that first point about what are new markets you could tap into, new audiences, new channels, using um, using AI to, to create maybe new personas that you haven't fully tapped into yet and validating what tweaks might you need to make on your foundational product that you have to be able to then reach those new audiences as well. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, you know, how do you think there that you would recommend others balance the mix between, um, you know, really kind of data-based persona characteristics that come from AI versus AI kind of like making up things that it just kind of guesses or, or is that just semantics at, at that point? No, I think it's a, it's a great point. And we've heard so much about um, the risks of hallucination um, and, uh, you know, validating what's coming out of the AI. And so that's why it's super important to that you can't abdicate responsibility to your AI tools that you're using. They are tools, but ultimately you are still in charge. And I think that's a a key piece of of anything that we use, right? And so then maintaining that as part of the fabric um, of the culture that you're creating in terms of how you and your organization use AI to really challenge what you're seeing, ask for citations, um, validate it by just probing further and asking more and more questions to make sure that you've got the right, right answers. And I would also add to that, um, be very cognizant of how you are training those models and how you have cleansed the data that you're using for training and um, uh, how you are testing what you're putting in. You know, do you have the, the notion of a, a red team, essentially, who will, whose, whose sole focus is to kick the tires really hard and try and break it and bring all these different edge cases uh, to the to the mix so that you can you can see well if I, if I go you know down this straight path yes okay everything's fine but what happens when I bring all these other scenarios to, into play can I still trust the result that I'm getting or have you have you really um, uh, validated it from different angles yeah trust but verify one hundred percent. I'm curious, um, because you mentioned kind of training different models, Um, one of the conversations that I've seen is the pros and cons of using a trained model um, that you have a lot of control and and privacy around um, versus using something, um, you know, the big boys, ChatGPT, GPT-4, right? Obviously, when we're talking about GPT-4, huge amounts of data that are available, um, but the drawback is definitely kind of a privacy concern in that way as well. So is is there a balance? balance in your mind, when do you recommend using kind of more public models versus a homegrown trained model? Yeah, good question. So I think there's no 
it, it's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a spectrum. So on the one end, uh, you could use completely open source tools, but then just as you mentioned, you have risks of privacy, um, bias, control, security, et cetera, right? And then on the other end, um, you can build everything yourself, but then you have the uh, downsides of the cost it will take, the expertise that you need to have in-house, the time it's going to take you to build that. And then in between those two ends, you have multiple different options. You can use models that are just trained on your proprietary information. Um, you can use capabilities that are off the shelf that are available. But even as you look at off the shelf capabilities, you want to ask how much can I customize this to what's happening in my organization? Um, and then also ask a lot of questions like, because there are so many AI um, products and tools out there right now, what do you expect um, the longevity of that organization to be? Um, how much can you trust their security levels in the same way that if you're going to be putting your data um, out there, you need to be able to ensure that they have the right level of security and control and so forth to, um, to, to take your data. And so, forth. so I think it, it really depends on the usage um, and the, the use case scenario. So if it's for something that is essentially the secret sauce for your organization, you're going to want to keep that a lot closer. Um, but if it's for another task that maybe isn't quite as sensitive, uh, you can look at some other options within that. So I think it really depends on this particular use case. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that makes sense. I think that's definitely a good, um, a good barometer to kind of follow. Yeah. Um, so I, I have another question. We kind of started at, at senior leaders and, and swung away, which is great. I love the, I love the meandering um, nature of the conversation, but I do want to loop back before we get too far down the road, because, you know, I, I, as senior leaders, you know, our CPOs, our founders, they're really remaining very connected um, to the strategic um, initiatives and they're making sure that their efforts are really to go after what best benefits the business, right? And that's kind of the, the large area that AI is occupying in their mind from a lot of those um, icebreaker questions that we saw in the chat. That's really seems to be the theme. My question there is, while those senior product leaders are remaining really focused on strategic AI application, how do they also make sure that they're really supporting their teams with AI exploration? Again, making sure that these guidelines exist between here's when you should use an AI assistant tool versus this is what you should use in-house and we've built for you, or you know, here's how we encourage um, you know, a sense of openness to AI in our organization versus we've heard some sentiments that um, people feel like it's cheating, right? Uh, things, things like that. How, how do you balance that? And how do you recommend that um, leaders do that? Yeah, so I think leaders need to really set the tone for their organization around how are we going to approach AI? Um, you know, is this like, what's our risk tolerance? What's our appetite? How do we want to provide um, guardrails for people to use this? And I think that is something that leaders should be very deliberate about. So setting up a process or policy around these are the scenarios in which we are comfortable with you using AI. Um, and these are the things you can share. These are the things you absolutely should not share. Um, and these are scenarios where we are comfortable with you using it, but here are the caveats um, of when you shouldn't do it or how you should do it safely. And so I think providing a very clear roadmap to employees to say, here are the do's, here are the don'ts, here are the scenarios, and here's who you go to when you have a question about it. Don't just wing it. Don't put confidential or proprietary data out there but here's how you can do it in a, in a very intentional, um, smart way, I think is really, really key. And then I think the second piece of that is also, while you have the guardrails, um, you also want to encourage a culture of innovation and experimentation and let people know that this is something that you want them to embrace because this is how you learn as an organization. And this is how you, you grow and you try new things and create that sense of openness and um, willingness for people to be able to try things in a safe, controlled way. And some some good uh, forms for that are uh, hackathons uh, or innovation labs or kind of ring-fenced safe spaces for people to operate. 
It's um, that's a great segue into a. Uh, um, another question that I see here from someone that um, is kind of thinking about innovation as well and how AI plays into the innovation process. Do you have any examples or particular strategies that you have been that you've found to be really successful when approaching AI as part of the innovation process, as part of the ideation process? Let's say think about um, think about it from from both dimensions. So one is what are the things that AI is really good at doing right now. So what are the capabilities? And I would um, kind of the top three that I would look at are AI is really good at distilling large amounts of data and um, you know, combing through it, summarizing it, putting it in a very usable format. Um, the second thing is uh, chatbot capabilities, right? So being very interactive, creating a dialogue, um, being able to uh, have that ongoing conversation, if you will. And then third is really generating new content. Um, so creating new capabilities, and we have some people using it for marketing content or uh, creating code and so forth. Right? So on one side, looking at what are the what are things that AI is really good at right now, and then on the other dimension, looking at what are what are the needs that you have from a product perspective, uh, from a customer perspective? Where are your gaps? What's your customer feedback telling you? What are people most often calling in about um, or that they have issues about? Or what are areas of the market that you haven't been able to tap into yet, but you know you want to get there? And then thinking about how do you bring these two pieces together? And I think that's where if you can think about it from both dimensions and then have a really uh, open brainstorming session, you'll start to see some, some innovative ideas coming through. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And and my next question, you might tell me that you have just answered actually, but um, the it, it's apt because the next thing I wanted to know from you is, you know, what are some of the ways that you believe that utilizing AI is going to help us really stay ahead of others in the market, right? We're obviously, we all have access to this tool. We're all thinking about this transformation process, but how do we make sure that we're really um, staying a step ahead um, and not just kind of like jostling in the pack all the time? Yeah, I think really using it for um, competitive analysis and market trends. And this is an area that, particularly in the product space, is something that we all want to do, but it requires a lot of dedicated, focused time to typically do a market research and that level of analysis with the level of rigor that you need. And as we all know, there are so many competing priorities for our time every day. This often is one of those things that just doesn't always get the time that it deserves. And so I think this is a great uh, way to use AI to help you do a lot of that heavy lifting, a lot of those time intensive tasks and distill it down for you so that you can stay ahead of what's happening in the market. Um, and really have it be be a, a partner to you in as you in the Yeah, and I think that that partnership aspect um, is really essential for folks as we're starting to grapple with the feeling that, um, you know, there's a lot of fear about replacement, right? What jobs, you know, there's like always a news article about the job, 10 top jobs that are going to be eliminated. And, and there are going to be shifts like that, but what are some suggestions you have for how we can really use this tool as a partner, as you say, and as, um, really kind of an advantage to help bring us up rather than feeling like it's a competitor of, for our jobs right, that we have to feel defensive about? Yeah, so I think we're going to see a lot of changes in the market. Um, and in the same way that when we've had various other technology changes, um, you didn't see it replace people per se, but rather people upskilled and learned new ways to use that technology to then be more efficient in what they were doing. And if you think about that in the same the same light here, if you can use it to do a lot of the uh, repetitive tasks that you might have, things that take up a lot of time, um, but um, but maybe don't add quite as much value, it enables you as a product leader to then focus on more of the strategy, more of the, the vision of your product, more of the creativity, more of where are we going? How do we, how do, we do new interesting things with our products? Think about the transformation um, as opposed to spending so much of our, our day um, on other tasks. And I think a, a good thing to think about this is um, observing what you do in a given day. Um, and just even looking at your calendar or thinking back and reflecting on where did I spend most of my time through the course of the day. And based on that, I think you can do two things. One is 
you can observe what are the mundane tasks that you needed to do, how many meetings did you sit in, but you didn't really necessarily need to be there. Um, and so how can you automate some of those tasks to free up more time? The second dimension of it is through the course of the day, as you looked at, you know, Monday morning, what your to-do list was, and then Friday afternoon, how many of those things you actually got done, what are the things that you wished you had more capacity or capability to be doing? And so then how can AI help you support those initiatives as well? So thinking about it from, from both of those lenses, um, I think is, is a good way to think about it, um, to your point, right? So it's, it's going to enhance your capability to be even better at what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense in really kind of looking for opportunities to save yourself time and optimize your time so that you can really stand out more um, and, and kind of use that additional time for upskilling or making yourself more valuable. Um, I know that there's always a tension in the product world between um, the, the strategic and the urgent, right? Um, so getting those urgent items, those urgent small fires off yeah. the plate so that we can spend more time on strategy. Do you think that the automation of all of these kind of more um, mundane tasks or more um, kind of repetitive tasks is going to impact the experience that junior product managers have to learn how things work um, in the space before they start shifting into strategy and in a more senior role? That's a great question. So I will, um, let me give an analogy that I've seen in the uh, customer support space as an example. So um, we've seen a number of case studies in the market showing that with the use of AI, it's actually really helped more um, junior level, entry level customer support individuals get up to speed a lot quicker because instead of them having to through all these manuals and retain all of that information, it's essentially they have someone sitting next to them, if you will, that can be a resource to help them understand, oh yeah, when I get these kinds of questions, this is how I need to answer it. Um, and really being that support uh, in the same way that you might be able to shadow um, uh, someone else when you join an organization. And so I think if you look at that parallel, I think it's, it's a great way to um, provide a, a knowledge resource to folks as they're coming into the role. Um, and I think it's also a great tool to think about your own development plan and um, use it to, to validate, hey, these are the skills I have, these are the, the things that I want to learn, what would be a good development plan for me to create to get there. Yeah, that's such a great point. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you have thoughts or recommendations for uh, team leaders, product leaders who are thinking about the best approach to upskill their teams and upskill their people on AI tasks specifically, as well as helping them start to unlearn certain habits about how they use AI? Like, how would you um, how would you tactically go about training your team and up leveling your team? Yeah, so I would start with a, coming back again to the to the culture culture of openness. We want people to feel comfortable trying and testing new things, that, that culture of experimentation. Um, and then making resources available to people so that they can they can absorb them on their own, uh, you know, on their at their own speed. Um, and really curating resources for team members to say these are you know the top three things that you can use to get up to speed on AI. Or if you've got an hour these are the five resources, the five articles that we'd recommend you read. Um, or here are two tools that we think are really good. Um, carve out an afternoon to, to play with them and try them out. Um, but really, the more you can make it hands-on, the better. I would also add um, having this notion of a partner can make it a lot more fun. So can you pair up people in your organization and say, can you both go and figure this out together? And see what you can do. And then it becomes a lot more, a more creative, more social, um, and more interesting of an experience. I love the buddy system, the swim buddy. I think yes. that's wonderful. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, we've gotten a couple of questions about um, competitive analysis um, and kind of market trend analysis that you mentioned a little bit earlier. So I want to ask a couple of questions about that. Um, the first one being is, you know, do you feel that there is a lack of potency in competitive assessment or using, um, you know, is there, how effective is market trend analysis given that there is data latency in some of these tools? And so we might not always have, you know, every piece of information that you would if you dug it up on your own. 
Yeah, true. Um, totally valid point. So two things I'd say there. One is um, even just today, I came across uh, an organization that was working on um, tools to bring in real-time data into their into their models. And I think that's something that we'll start to see more and more of, um, particularly in different industries where you need to have that real-time data. Um, and it's so critical. So I think that's, that's an evolving space that we'll probably see changes in. Um, the second is coming back to validating the output that you get. So it might give you some information, but you can't abdicate all that responsibility and just say, okay, I have the answer. I'm just going to turn in my, my homework now. But you still have to do your due diligence and on top of what you see, validate what you see and do your do additional research to, to confirm those answers and to bring in more real-time information. Yep. And I think that's a really great um, kind of recurrent theme for us through this conversation as well, is reminding ourselves that this is not a magic wand. Um, and even though this is a conversational tool, it is not a being who will suddenly just do your job for you. Um, it is a, um, an approach or a tool that you can use, but you are still the one that is driving the bus. So you've got to um, always kind of check. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we're thinking about those tools, there's a couple of questions here that are curious. Have you um, come across or do you recommend any specific tools or services um, for market trends or competitive analysis, right? Beyond chat GPT, are there any kind of particular specialized tools that you like or that you have seen other groups kind of start to explore? There are a ton of tools out there. Um, and rather than recommending a, a specific tool, I would advise thinking again about what is the specific task that you're looking to accomplish? Um, what are your specific requirements? Um, and then validating the capabilities of the various tools that are on the market against what it is that you're actually looking for. Um, so again, doing your due diligence because there are so many, so many good tools out there um, and really being deliberate about what problem are you trying to solve? And then which uh, which capability is going to be the closest match to what we're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, question here about, um, you know, you've, you've spoken quite a bit um, about how it's really the leader's role to establish a culture around using AI. There's some concerns here in a question about how to avoid a culture of consumption, right? So of course we have to do our own research, um, but, you know, I personally have been in a couple conversations where I asked another human being for um, their experience or their thoughts or perceptions of a particular thing and received back, hey, I typed this into ChatGPT and here's a list of ideas that it came back with, right? And, um, and, and that's more of an interpersonal kind of cultural challenge, right? To me, I was like, oh, I, you know, I could have typed it in myself. Like I wanted, you know, that's like having someone say, let me Google that for you, right? Yeah, right. Um, so how do we... How do we really encourage exploration, but also avoid a culture of consumption? <laughs> yeah, it's it's an it's an interesting question, and you know I think one that probably as a society and as a as a culture we'll see an evolution. Right, if you think back, what thirty years before we started using the internet, it was a very different model, and you could have asked the same question. Well, now I'm not going to ask another human about something, you're just going to Google it, right? So I think it's going to be a, a societal evolution, but we still need to maintain that humanity, that social touch, um, you know, that connection, because you get a lot of other nuances from talking to other people and um, and their personal experiences and a lot of the, the color around what they're actually sharing. Um, so it, I think it's, it's going to be a balance. And maybe in the scenario you described, you, I, I would say, it's perfectly appropriate to respond back in a polite but professional way. Hey, that's great. But I really wanted to hear your perspective. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I agree. Um, and I, I do think that it's probably going to, as you say, evolve into kind of social norms, nice niceties and mores of what is an appropriate usage. Uh, I also think it touches interestingly on transparency of AI in your work deliverables and in your outputs, right? So, you know, at what point do you say, hey, here's what I came up with and I used AI to do it, right? Versus I, I don't tell people, hey, here's my data and I used this Excel formula to do it. Nobody cares. I just, you know, I've created the deliverable and here you have it, right? So I think that there's also a balance of the 
when is it appropriate to declare that AI played a role in the deliverable that you are offering um, or bringing to market versus um, just kind of keeping it to yourself? Yeah, yeah. And I think that is a really um, hot topic right now that a lot of people are thinking about and looking at, do you put a watermark on output Mm -hmm. that has come from an AI? And at what point, to your example, right, does that um, sort of become redundant versus that's a socially accepted norm where you see a watermark that that indicates that this is the you know generated content. So I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of discussion on this topic um, over the coming weeks. Yep, I think so, and I think you can already see it kind of bubbling up in you know different spectrums of where usage is accepted versus um, kind of uh, maligned, right? So you can definitely see in the academic sector, right? Students are um, for bad, oh, like uh, point blank from using yeah. it um, on, on homework and assignments and things like that. That's probably the strongest area um, that I have seen a lot of guidelines coming out about. It's a big no-no, right? Um, versus in certainly a more technology and a more product-driven space, there seems to be um, a lot more excitement and expectation um, that you should be using this in your work. So yeah, interesting yeah. to see those those forces together. Um, I have a, a multi part question here that is long, but I really like it. Uh, so I'm going to pose this to you. So thinking about a couple kind of big picture challenging aspects here. So first of all, the the rapid obsolescence, right? How do we um, you know, how do product managers really effectively mitigate the risk of of AI powered products that they're creating, that they're bringing to the market directly, right? Becoming immediately obsolete due to established players, new players coming on the scene, just the absolute rapid um, fire uh, evolution that we're seeing here. So that's kind of the first part. And then Also mixing with that, how do product teams from maybe kind of smaller organizations really differentiate their offerings and and maintain competitive advantages against the big boys, right? Like our industry giants, the the Microsofts, the Googles, things like that. How how do those kind of forces play together? And and I realize that was a a big question and maybe not a very pointed one. So you can tackle that as um, the thoughts come to you. Yeah. So on the, on the second part of that question, I would come back to some of the product fundamentals. Um, think about, and I think this applies even to the first part of the question as well, right? So who is your customer? What are you trying to solve for them? Um, and really getting deep in understanding who they are. And if you can understand that and understand how you are really creating value in a differentiated way, if your your product is going to resonate, um, if you are focused on those two things, you know who that who that user is, and you know how you are providing value in a unique way, um, and that's how we've seen like uh, all these various companies that start out as startups and then grow because they have they have a value proposition that resonates and they understand who they're trying to reach, and so it's not necessarily predicated on the size of your organization. Every organization started from somewhere, right? Um, And so I think really being deliberate about about those product fundamentals and the value you're creating is going to be the key there. Um, The other piece is thinking about the fact that things are changing so quickly. How do you design your product in such a way that you can be more nimble, right? So that maybe you have core, um, core capabilities, but it is set up such that you can add a lot of tweaks and um, new features very quickly to address pivots or changes in the market or different audiences or different needs as they they come up. But I think just the awareness of the speed at which you're operating in is the first step to being able to then design your product in such a way that it's it's more um, more nimble to be responsive. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I'm curious how, um, you know, kind of thinking back about all of these different ideas and how we're kind of using 
using these new approaches to come up with different business options, come up with different value propositions. Um, you know, how do you at a leadership level, the CIOs, the CTOs, the CPOs, right? How do you really help aggregate all of those ideas and those visions into an actual viable product? Does AI have a role to play there? Or do you think that that should really be primarily um, the, forgive me, the old school way of kind of doing that, right? Right. I think it absolutely um, has a role. And I would bring it back to if you think about the role of um, a product leader and even of uh, any product professional. Um, when I was early in my career, the way which uh, someone described it to me, which has always stuck with me, is that you were essentially the mini, a mini CEO. Um, Mm -hmm. you are responsible for all the dimensions of your product. The buck stops with you. And that's a big job because that encompasses not only creating a vision and roadmap and strategy for your product, it also includes developing requirements and shepherding the development and the launch and the, um, the actual creation of the product. And it involves partnering with all of your stakeholders, marketing, sales, support, risk. And it involves staying on top of all the market trends and what's happening with your competitors and really being attuned to what's going on. And so I think um, product leaders are extremely, because you've built up that skill set, um, which is a pretty powerful skill set to be able to juggle all of those competing demands at the same time, uh, are extremely well positioned to then also think about how do I add one more ball into all of these things that I'm juggling, which is how can AI apply across all of these different dimensions um, and how do you use it in a meaningful way? And so it can be um, it can be top down from your executive leadership or it can be bottoms up um, as people think about different ways that they can apply AI to to enhance the product. Makes sense. I have a um, couple kind of zoomed out questions for you as we kind of wrap up here. Um, The first one being, you know, obviously everyone on this call has joined today to learn more about AI and how they can apply it to their work. Um, And I mentioned at the top of the call as well that Pragmatic just on Monday um, opened a limited run of workshop seats um, for how you can use AI in product. Um, Callie can drop the link again for you guys if you're curious about that. But, you know, in addition to some of these really great resources, resources. Where are the spaces that you hang out to to keep up to date on AI? And where do you suggest that people go to continue to kind of stay ahead of the curve and um, just be part of those conversations as they evolve? Yeah. So a lot of different places. And I think the way that you absorb information, maybe, you know, it's, it's unique to each person, right? Some people like to watch videos. Some people like to read articles. Some people like to be very hands-on in, um, in learning. So think about what resonates for you and that'll make it easier for you to absorb new information as it comes. Um, I would also say, look at a lot of, there's so many great resources out there from podcasts, to articles, to all the great work that Pragmatic is doing, um, to training sessions, uh, to conferences. So take advantage of those and raise it with your um, with your organization. Say, hey, I really want to attend this thing. Um, you know, can I can I join? And there's so many virtual options. You know, to keep the costs low so you don't have to travel and so forth, right? But um, really be proactive in investing in your own learning through those different channels. Um, and the other thing I would say is just get out there, um, talk to other people, um, go to events that you see, your local meetups in your area um, where they're talking about product and AI and you know topics that are relevant to you, but just you'll get a lot out of those organic conversations as well, um, rather than, than kind of just the one directional conversations. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that's uh, a really good jumping off point for folks. Um, last question for you here. Um, if everyone on this call was going to take away just two things, um, just two things that you could guarantee that they will do um, here on out going forward and they will remember and really um, take to heart, regardless if they're a chief product officer, a hands-on product professional, um, an intern, what would the two things um, be? See, I'm not super mean. I say two, not, I don't make you pick one. (laughs) Yes, that's that's great. It's hard to even just pick two, right? So um, the two things I would say, number one, invest in yourself, invest in your learning, um, make the time because no one else will make the time for you. You need to make it a priority, carve it out, um, figure out when's the best opportunity for you to do that, but invest in your own 
education and learning. So you stay up to date because things are moving so fast and you don't want to have that feeling of, I don't know what's going on and I'm feeling it, right? So really invest in your own learning and make the time for that. The second thing I would say is really think about this as an opportunity to build your own leadership skills. So are there ways that you can use the fact that things are changing so fast to um, be a leader in your organization? Uh, because everyone is trying to figure this out. Can you set up brown bag sessions or lunch and learns or do a roundup of um, AI uh, resources and do a, do a monthly briefing for people or bring in external speakers? Look at ways that you can also use this to showcase leadership and drive innovation um, and creativity in your organization. Uh, because everyone's trying to figure it out. And I think it's a great opportunity for people to also uh, further their experiences and their leadership capabilities as well. That's a wonderful point for us to kind of um, wrap on. Um, I cannot tell you how much I have personally enjoyed and learned from this conversation. Um, and I feel really very confident speaking for everybody else on this call on the same point. Um, this has been an exceptional conversation. Thank you so much for your thoughts and your insights. Um, this has been really wonderful to have you. Thank you. This has been terrific. I really appreciate being here with you.